Damn. I feel like a woman. Hey, it's Chapo. And uh, we're all feeling like ladies today. Um, happy belated 9 11 to everyone who celebrates. Oh, wait, before I forget, because you cheapskates didn't pay for this episode, at the top of the hour, we are giving you the plug for the tour. Now, I announced this uh, on the last uh, Patreon episode. So I think there are probably some of you out there who uh, feel safe in the knowledge that, like, hmm, you know, I know they're going to be in town, but you know what? They're going to release the live show as an audio recording. I'll, I'll, I'll hear what went down. You know, if there's anything good to the live show, if there's any gems got dropped, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'm sure they'll put it out as part of the regular scheduled podcast. Wrong. No gems. <laughs> no. <laughs> Zero gems. The only people who will know the secret forbidden truths we share at these this next state of slate of live shows in Chicago, L.A., New York, and Miami, Fort Lauderdale will be the people who buy tickets and see us live. Uh, some of you we are rewarding by not releasing our live episodes as part of the podcast feed. Others of you we are punishing or rather encouraging you to come see us perform live. Like as I explained before... These live shows will be like um, Tibetan sand mandalas. It will be beautifully constructed, and then they will just be whoosh, washed away when they're over to be heard and experienced only one time ever. So if, you, if that sounds like something that you might be interested in, once again, in Chicago, L.A., New York, and Miami, Fort Lauderdale, please, I implore you to ch check out chapotraphouse.com slash live and buy tickets for this extraordinary live experience, which will only be experienced by the people in the room. Look, there have been a lot of whiners about the live episodes, and you know what? We get it. We're very proud of the live content that we do. We think it's great. But, you know, like the experience of, um, you know, either commuting to community college or um, commuting from community college where you are an instructor, you're teaching some sort of advanced driving class, you're teaching future police officers how to do pit maneuvers, I presume. <laughs> um, you know, you don't you don't like the FOMO. You don't like hearing the audience sounds. Well, we get it. Um, except, OK, so these are live only. We're taking another thing that you've said into account. You know how you're always telling us like, oh, you should have Stavros on. You've never had Stavros on. Well, we're finally going to do it. He will be on for the first time. Oh, you want us to, you want us to interview your stats professor? We're doing it. You want us to talk to Ralph Nader? He's going to be there. He's going to shoot ping pong balls <laughs> out of his pussy. You, 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 you want us, you want us to, I don't know. Talk to the that guy who they just wrote the article about him where it's like, this guy's a Democratic consultant, but he has parties. <laughs> We're talking to him. He's going to be there. And you know what? You'll never Felix, hear it unless you come. Uh, Felix, I am saving that article for one of these live shows, though, because it was too good. It was too good to to, to piss away. Oh, a man. Live audience. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really excited for that. I don't want to, like, go into it too deep to spoil the live show, but it is... Um, I don't know. I think it's cool to write an article about someone where like the subtext is like, guess who's having casual sex <laughs> <laughs> like in the newspaper? Uh, well, uh, so let's kick things off for today's show. Like I said, uh, belated, belated, belated 9-11 remembrances to uh, everyone, everyone listening. Uh, none Shout of them remembers 9-11. <laughs> Every single person listening to this show right now has no conscious memories of 9-11 as they Disgusting. were not born yet. They were not born. And if you do, you know, um, just uh, never forget. That's all I got to say. Never forget. I will say, though, um, my favorite part about this t now 21st anniversary of 9-11. Hey, it can drink. It can now legally enter a bar in America. Who would have thought? Uh, but my favorite part about this 21st anniversary of 9-11 is the absence, the absence of what has become a 9-11 sort of ritual, a sort of tradition. I'm speaking, of course, about Artie Fleischer's um, annual retweeting of all of his tweets from 9-11. His, his annual oh, no, tweeting, he would do it his annual Twitter thread. Year he would do it over again. He would like yeah. would always artisanally craft it. That's how much he got off on it. That fucking yeah. freak. <laughs> Where was it this year? He announced that he is retiring 
his annual reminiscence oh, on his minute by the minute by minute account. Not nine eleven. I wonder why he would do that. <laughs> he is he is retiring his minute by minute account of basically being shuffled into a bunker for an entire day with George W. Bush while Dick Cheney um, looted the Black Eagle Trust Fund and you know shot a, shot the United ninety three out of the sky with a missile. Um, no, he uh, retired his annual reminiscings on nine uh, eleven because I mean, or not because of. I will just say. It's merely a coincidence that he was hired to do PR for the Saudi golf tour um, a couple months before it's now 25th, 21st, 9-11 anniversary. Do you think that that has anything to do with uh, the fact that he's forgot about 9-11? <laughs> I, I think it would be like he's still doing it, but it's more like an internal presentation. And it's more like when you go to Epcot and it's like Disney through the ages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with any other good... Uh, 9-11 remembrances. I mean, the only other thing that I uh, took note of um, on this 9-11 is that they're back to trying to pretend that Iran did 9-11. Who's trying that? Just the, the usual suspects, you know. Like, oh, like uh, FDD. Yeah, the, for, for, yeah, for, for, for Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, something on Fox News. Uh, Iran's role in 9-11 planning requires further investigation. Well, yeah, you know, if you don't figure it out in the first uh, 21 years, uh, you got 21 <laughs> more to try. Um I, you know, Iran, uh, you know, okay. They official, they, they issued official condolences, which is like anyone can do that. The Saudis did that, even though, you know, they sent it from the same letterhead they used to plan it. But, um, <laughs> I, I, okay. There was a lot of people don't know this. There was a candlelight vigil in Iran on nine 11, like for America attended by thousands of people like Jesus fucking Christ. That is like. Oh my god! It's like yeah, that's but when uh, Felix, you know, you're forgetting a, oh, about you're forgetting about that group of Iranian art students who were caught dancing in New Jersey on nine eleven. Oh yeah, the Iranians. That? Yeah, they're Iranian, <laughs> yeah. right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah they're from so, Iran, and then when they were on Iranian TV, they uh, you know talked about how they were just doing their job. Uh, no, it, like doing that, like the Iranians fucking doing that. That is like uh, when a really religious family. Like one of uh, someone in their family gets killed and they protest against the execution of the guy that killed them. I, I mean, like, God bless them. Uh, that is a, a it's beautiful of them. But like, holy shit, did we not deserve that candlelight visual judging by how we acted immediately after that? <laughs> it's so well, infuriating I mean, because, OK, who is more responsible uh, for 9-11, the Saudis uh, or Iran? Which one of their intelligence services was like instrumental in creating Al Qaeda in the first place? It was not Iran. In fact, like right after the invasion of Afghanistan, they tried to work with us to protect like a Shia minority in Afghanistan. Yeah, the Hazars. And yeah, and like, you know, we should not have invaded there, obviously, but there was some decent cooperation there just for practicality's sake because, you know, they spoke the language. They uh, did all the things we didn't do. And then when the axis of evil speech, of course, happened, of course, that uh, went out the window and those people were slaughtered. Uh, you're right, Felix. It is the um, foundation for defense of democracies. I'm just reading here. It says, if you want to make the case that Iran was complicit, directly complicit in 9-11, you don't have enough information. Bill Roggio, senior fellow at the Nonprofit Foundation for Defense of Democracies and editor of Long War Journal, told Fox News Digital, but if you want to say that Iran has sheltered and is essentially a state sponsor of terrorism because it's harboring and providing material support for Al Qaeda pre and post 9-11, you can easily make that case. This is really weak. They're not even really trying here. They're just like, look, if you're looking for evidence that Saudi Arabia had anything to do with 9-11, we're going to have to keep looking. But if you're looking for evidence that Iran um, also did uh, maybe kind of did 9-11 or supports Al-Qaeda, well then, buddy, we've got plenty of evidence there. We'd be happy to show it to you after this commercial break. <laughs> or or you, can, like, I mean, you can donate to the Foundation of, Defense of Democracies for uh, further information on this intelligence that they have. It's just... Uh, do they have small donors? I have to say, being a small donor to FDD is like oh probably the most monthly payment. Dude, being a small donor to FDD is like tipping your utility company when you pay your bill. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, I mean, Iran. Okay, so Iran, Iranian intelligence services have had some contact with Al Qaeda in the past. There have been some Al Qaeda guys that like hid in Iran just because it's like. 
I, I mean, you know, that's what intelligence services do. I think they all exist to fucking talk to Al Qaeda. I think there's one guy in Costa Rica that makes up their version of the IRGC or CIA, and he just is pen pals with one lowly Al Qaeda guy. Yeah, that's what they're there for. But like, so, <laughs> if you want to talk about who's talking to Al Qaeda after 9 11, I mean, I think. You- <laughs> find far four more co- co- correspondences from the cia than the IRGC. Well, or or, or before 9 11 i mean, yeah, right. I mean yeah. if, if the standard here is that like oh uh iranian intelligence services um uh had contacts with al-qaeda prior to 9 11 then buddy have i got news for you about some other intelligence services out there um if you're saying that uh, iran harbored some of the people who did 9 11 wait till you hear about the intelligence agencies that let them into the country <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it is, yeah, you just can't go down that road. I mean, the thing that they, the FDD people did, like, the less delusional ones that they tried after the fact when they realized that, like, they weren't going to stick 9-11 on Iran as much as they needed to for a war, which they really fucking wanted. They were really going for that in 05 and 06, and people just weren't for it. It was going, well, look what they've done to our brave troops in the country that we invaded right next door. They're minding their own business. Those uh, those shaped charges, the the, the, the penetrative uh, explosives. I got to say, that really ground my gears. The way that they referred to attacks on American occupation troops in Iraq as terrorist attacks. Yeah. Like, that's not what that is. I'm sorry. They're a fucking military formation. How, if they are not a, a, a valid target, according to laws of war, then what the fuck is? Yeah, that that is like what the more normal, you know, quote unquote, normal people uh, in the NATSEC sphere, uh, many Democrats, many like anti-Trump Republicans said after Trump killed Soleimani, they're like, well, I hate Trump, but this is good because of the terrorist attacks he commanded on American troops during the insurgency. And it's like, if that's terrorism, then just like any, like agit Corps was terrorism then. <laughs> <laughs> what amazing that they what? haven't decided to just go retro on that and apply it to everything else because i mean they don't even call like the cuban revolution terrorism because by that definition it, it absolutely was uh, uh ambushings uh military patrols and stuff that's terrorism yeah who could forget the horrible terrorist attack in 1944 in normandy waged by the americans <laughs> The, the terrorist strike at Lexington and Concord. <laughs> it's like, fine, you want to do that. Let's have fun. But like, it's not viable. Uh, well, you know, I mean, again, just uh, not, not, not too much, not too much juice to be squeezed out of uh, 9-11 on uh, 9-11 20- juice is is run out. And it really is like 9-11. It's over for you, honey. I mean, you got a whole generation who don't remember it at all. And everybody else has moved on because the, the 9-11 framework of this civilizational conflict on some distant frontier has been replaced by war at home so the the, yeah. the vocabulary of the war on terror and the primal scene of 9-11 are now have been superseded there's new primal scenes like like the george floyd protests which are far more or, or january 6th which are the things that are like blazoning into our current uh, uh understanding of uh who our enemies are like yeah it's, it's not it's okay. not terrorism or muslims or any of that bullshit yeah, and 9-11, I mean, the FDD guys are just so, they're so superfluous for the Republican side. They've always been like, uh, you know, it's a bipartisan, awful think tank, but decidedly more on the Republican side of the NATSEC sphere. But um, they are kind of like a 25-year-old having a fake ID for Republicans because it used to be like, okay, we need, we're going to use this 9-11 cudgel to, uh, you know, stoke anti-Muslim sentiment and like maybe hit the immigration bell just the right amount. But it's like they don't need that anymore. This subtext is gone. You don't need an excuse. You just go out and say it. Yeah, folks, you want folks, you want to know how wash 9-11 is in about three years time. Leonardo DiCaprio is going to leave her for the Stephen Paddock shooting. Boom! <laughs> yeah i mean it won't even it won't even be a marker of time anymore it won't even be like oh you date girls with no memory of 9-11 it'll be like uh oh you date girls with no memory of gary condit <laughs> and the you, summer you, of the you, shark you date, you date no girls with memories of the first benefer Ooh, <laughs> wow which is by the way back they're back yes i know you hey, can see how hey, culture is literally him. moving back we're in a time quake <laughs> backward now and like we're like, rushing towards like uh, uh, Felix has talked about this a lot. We're already like in like the 2012, like around 2012. We're hurtling back into the Bush era. This is like Tenet. 
I mean, have you, there is like, there has been a, uh, I, they might be out of it now. Uh, I, I still see, I still see a lot of it out, out in the world. I mean, there was an early 2000s fashion craze. Yep. You know, I'm dang low rise jeans. Yeah. Christopher Nolan uh, really missed, uh, miss, missed the stitch here in Tenet. There should have been a scene in that movie where the Twin Towers reconstruct themselves. That should have been the climax of that movie. You know what I think is, comes uh, next? I don't, I don't think there's anything and John stopping D- this. There's nothing going to pull us back. We're going next. Jinkos, big t-shirts, big graphic t-shirts with uh, hip-hop Looney Tunes or like <laughs> oh, uh, sexually charged back. company names like Big Johnson's, that kind of thing. <laughs> no Poet fear. Naked. Go ahead naked. Go ahead naked. That's where we're going. Yeah, I would love to see. I would love to see like a uh, sort of waifish young woman, a, a, a new school grad wearing a gangsta Tweety Bird jacket. <laughs> uh, uh, has anyone seen Blade Trinity? Oh, yeah. I, no, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I've that, seen Blade Trinity. Jessica Biel, Ryan Reynolds bring right. a little heat. I think it came out in 2004. And in it, Jessica Beals is wearing that like... Uh, that like evanescence ass, like a uh, Lita from WWF thing with like the skin tight, long sleeve shirt and then the low rise jeans. And I saw I watched it. I recently saw, was, saw it on TV uh, and I was like, oh, shit, they're dressing like that again. The ladies are dressing this way. It's early. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's early Bush. You know, what's going to be huge. And this is a huge recommendation for the many late bloomers in our audience. You know, if you're 37 there's going to be an article about you having casual sex. Here's one way. Here, here's one way to fast track that. All right. Get a t-shirt, get a t-shirt that Jesse Pinkman may wear, you know? Get yeah. A, yeah. Get like a big scary skull or like, um, it should just have like two words on it perhaps instead in like sort of a, um, if you remember the first cherry Coke font like that, yeah. and it should say, it should say something like, um, no entries, a band, a, you know, a condemned biohazard. And then under that, uh, wear a nice waffle tee, long sleeve waffle tee. A waffle a good tee, style. yes. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, T-shirt over the long sleeve shirt, that was the official uniform of 27-year-olds dating 17-year-olds. Just we're all, we're, all, we're all becoming pink, like sort of season one, season two, Jesse Pinkman. That's uh, the thing I was like, as... As history like reverses itself and we're going backwards in time, will we go back beyond the date of September 11th, or will history just like even going backward just hit like a sort of Terminator at 9/11? Like, will we will we recede further into the 90s, or will we just hit the wall of the early 2000s and then begin recycling shit again? Yeah, everyone's kind of been behaving like Final Three seasons, Jesse Pinkman, where it's like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sad. My the love of my life uh, died of heroin overdose. Oh, I'm sad. My best friend poisoned my stepson. Oh, boohoo, poor me. I was a slave. Um, whereas you need to be season one and two, Jesse. When he's wearing the cool shirts. I don't think we're going to be able to go much later, much uh, farther back than the nineties because nineties is the decade where people basically stop giving a shit. Like the nineties is when yeah. they start being like, I don't actually care how I look going outside. I would just like to be comfortable. And the eighties was the last vestige of uh, like fashion as a self-conscious, like part of someone's, uh, you know, uh, uh, identity. Uh, like when you do, when you look at those eighties fashions, it's like, damn, people were putting the work in. And now the entire point is to find a creative way to put zero work in. So I think we can only stick between that band. I don't think we can ever get to the point where people are, you know, like looking like a flock of seagulls videos. It's, it's just too time consuming. Everybody's, everybody's too tired. Everyone's too depressed. Yeah. I saw a, uh, there's a movie from 1999, like the last year of doing that, that I saw with Jason Biggs, you know, one of those movies where it's like, um, Oh, will will a lower middle class guy succeed in uh you know getting a girlfriend? Uh, Saving Solomon? And, no, it was one before that. It was it was um loser. I what it was. Is it the Woody? It Allen was loser. Movie? Yeah, it was loser. Okay. It was loser. loser yeah, and, that was his big Greg follow up to American Pie. Yeah, Greg Kinnear plays like an evil professor who's dating a student in it, and to like show that he's bad, there's a big scene of him buying a turtleneck. <laughs> it's like look <laughs> it how is much a sinister fucking- garment. It really is, but it is like that's like the implication that he cares about fashion too much. You know, uh, I think we've t- talked about this on the show, but before, but 
still has never sunk in for me that uh, Jason Biggs, not Jewish, Italian. It's crazy. I mean, I know if he, if he was going to be anything else, it would have had to have been that because they have that pact, the Italian Jewish pact. That they could play each other in movies, which is why one of the yeah. great rogues in film history was Sean Penn in Carlito's way. It's like careful Irish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah. love Kleinman though. That, that's my favorite Sean Penn performance. No, he's, he's half Jewish. He shows that they sh- it shouldn't just be limited, but generally it is. No. He's half Jewish. He gets in. Um, oh, okay, never mind. I, yeah, no, I would like to be. Um, I'd like to be played by uh, Bobby Cannavale's son in the movie about our show. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh Where's this God, Bobby Cannavale? Honored. Yeah, what about uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean he's a very handsome man. Um, if we're going right, hey, hey, graphic. Uh, well, guys, this is actually a perfect segue to uh, my next topic for today's show. Uh, gentlemen, rarely is the question asked, is our Hasidic Jewish kids learning? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, boy. Uh, talk about a talk about a can of worms they opened up. <laughs> Did you, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen this. Okay, this is going to start as a like a sort of a very New York City local story, but I think there are national implications that I want to get into. But there was a huge New York Times article that came out um, just yesterday that essentially um, does an audit of the private school system run by uh, New York City's Hasidic Jewish community, which is basically the size of Boston's entire public school system. It has something like fifty thousand kids, and uh, you know uh, gets receives. And this is, and the article like actually was the first time anyone ever did like I think a forensic audit of just how much money they get from the state, but the private school system uh, that educates only Hasidic Jewish children in New York gets three hundred and seventy five million dollars a year from the state of New York to essentially not teach kids anything other than the Talmud and like ancient Aramaic. I mean, like, look, the, the here's the uh, like the the sort of the nut graph from. Uh, the, the piece here. It says, the Hasidic Jewish community has long operated one of New York's largest private schools on its own terms, resisting any outside scrutiny on how st- its students are faring. But in 2019, the school, the Central United Talmudical Aid- Aid- Academy, agreed to give state standardized tests in reading and math to more than a thousand students. Every one of them failed. Students at nearly a dozen other schools run by the Hasidic community recorded similarly dismal outcomes last year, a pattern that under ordinary circumstances would signal an education system in crisis. But where other schools might be struggling because of underfunding or mismanagement, these schools are different. They are failing by design. And look, I mean, like the article just goes on to show that, like, I mean, like it interviews interviewed hundreds of people, including one of them, a 28 year old man who's left the Hasidic Jewish community who first learned to read English at 28 when someone gave him a Dr. Seuss book. I mean, they're showing like a, a really like, okay, look, the idea that there is any institution that is allowed to exist and call itself a school, where like, there is no emphasis made. I mean, like, where kids are just not taught to read and write. Like, I think that's a disgrace. But like, to also be getting that much money from the state, from our public education system, to essentially keep children in a state of complete ignorance and completely isolated from the world they live in. And, you know, I saw, I mean, some defenses, haha, of the, this, this abominable, uh, quote unquote, education system by, you know, the usual suspects, the Heritage Foundation or whatever. And um, there's this one guy who said, like, you know, middle America agrees with us that schooling is primarily about creating community, not about, edu- not about status and money. And to that, I, I, I replied to him, I think education is about primarily about teaching kids to read and write. And he replied to me, this guy, Jason Burdick or whatever from the Heritage Foundation. He said, uh, they, they can read and write in three languages. And that I replied, is one is, way to put it. <laughs> I replied, is English one of them? And no, it's uh, Hebrew, Aramaic and Yiddish, which look like that, I'm not saying that's not education, but I'm saying like, like if you're going to live in America, I don't think you should like kids should be illiterate by the age of like 12. Right. Um, this is always, this is the problem you have with, uh, Hasids. You have it also with fundamentalist Mormons. You I have was going to say, uh, they're the only two groups that have this kind of group just allowed to exist. Like you look at these kind of like close knit communities, they would be busted up by the police. They would never be allowed to get this far. It's only the Mormons and the, and the, and the Orthodox. Well, yeah, but you always, okay, you have this problem with like this type of thing. And I'm sure there's a, an equivalent in like every, a, every Western nation to some extent where like, yeah, 
there is a group where maybe, well, in the case of the fundamentalist Mormons and the Hasids, they are on average, your average guy that you pick out, your average family, they'll probably be lower income than the average more secular member or more normal member of their, uh, their, their, their sect in the broader nation. Um, but as a group, they have like, uh, you know, it's like a the sack of potatoes, so to speak. Um, they want it both ways always, right? They're saying, no, we're doing this because the secular world is disgusting. We want to maintain our values. Okay, fine. But they also want, you know, 10, 11 figures in fucking government largesses and get them always. Not only that, but they want like a parallel system backed up by the state. They want to have like their own ambulatory services. They want to have their own police. Uh, they want to have like, yeah, in this case, their own schools. And they always get them. They want they, they have their own the uh, bus Hasid, their service. It's paid for by the city. Yeah, they they uh, in the case of the Hasids, they're very involved in local government, which like, sure, that's everyone's right. But it just like, I don't know. I mean, I sound like a French person here, but you either have to uh, if you want to participate in this way, you should acknowledge there are secular values to this thing or there yeah. should be or that they're supposed to be. They're sort of enshrined. You cannot live in a modern, in a 21st century, like multicultural democracy. You cannot live in a secular modern society and essentially reap all of the value, like all the value and benefit and safety and protection that comes in living in that society and then demand that you have a right to keep kids in a state of illiteracy. Right. That is the big rub here. It, 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 look, this wouldn't be a thing if it was like the only thing they wanted was to wear coats when it's too hot. Look, I obviously disagree with that, but that's that is that's your thing. When it is preventing kids from like leaving into the outside world and fucking purposely keeping them from speaking the language of the world around them, behaving in every single way as a fucking abusive cult does, both in this this case, in the case of fundamentalist Mormons and fucking anything else like this you could find in America or, or elsewhere then it becomes a problem when you are being backwards in every single way that people are fucking backwards. I mean, I mean another detail in, in this article outside of just, you know, not teaching um, reading, writing, or basic arithmetic, or basically anything other than just studying the Talmud 12 hours a day. Um, also, the use of corporal punishment is commonplace in these schools. And there was, even a, there was even a detail about parents bribing teachers not to beat their children, which is like, okay, leaving aside, like, does this count as education? Like, no, you cannot beat kids, even in a private school. You can't do that. It's, it's illegal. Here, here's an interesting counterexample. Do the Pennsylvania Dutch and like Amish communities like did they take like did they get a lot of money from the state too like I'm 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 asking a question like I, I don't know the answer to this question but like it would be like like there there is a there is another that's a religious group of people that essentially have removed themselves from modern society they interact with modern society they're aware that it exists they even like you know allow for people to leave if they if they want but. Like, I mean, like, do the, like, the Amish, like, it seems like they're more dedicated to just kind of doing their own thing. I don't know. But well, like, yeah, but that's not... because they uh, are able to, you know, they're out in the, they're out in, uh, you know, the middle of the, they got farms, you know, they're not, they're not packed up. Right. I, I don't really like that either, to be honest with you. I just, it's one thing when you're doing it, when you are bringing children into this world and like, you just, you, whether, whatever your intentions are, okay, hypothetically, let's say that the Dutch, the Pennsylvania Dutch don't take any largesses from the state. Let's say they do it perfectly. It's still like there's something abusive and backwards about it that I really do not like, and I would pref like it to not happen. But like, yeah, I mean, the Hasids are a special case because they are, yeah, receiving government money to have <laughs> a school as would exist in the shtetl. Where you're, you're, I don't know, taking a tree branch and hitting a fucking kid with it. There is something, I mean, though, that I think, I don't know, I, I, like, if you think of it from their point of view, though, okay, the kids should not be doing these, you know, private schools, they should be going to public schools, but, like, New York public schools aren't that great either. And it's like, yes, obviously, there's a lot more actual education happening there, but also there's a degree of deculturalization. Like you're losing, like you're perceived as like the pat the patriarchs of these communities as somebody who's like, at least we have these 
this community. We have each other and we would rather uh, hold on to that than get our kids a education that might help them, you know, navigate a world that's also going to fuck them over because there's no uh, carrot to go with the stick of, uh, of like acceding to the wider culture anymore because the state is, is no longer capable of presenting any kind of uh, uh, idea of a safety net or uh, a path to upward mobility. That is the best argument I've heard for them. Uh, maybe you should take over as the PR guy for them, as opposed to the guy who is making those <laughs> oh, wonderful tweets. Oh, God, that's tweets. the thing. It's like, dude, you guys have a case. What are you doing? You're blowing it here. That they, uh, they, um, I don't know if people saw the tweets, but um, I, it's, they were definitely going in-house for this one. I will say that. Those were not written by any PR professional. Uh, let me just read. I'm going to read from like uh, not not Matt's um, sort of broader defense of the idea of maintaining sort of the boundaries of religious traditionalism within a, the modern society. This is in the Heritage Foundation guy, though, uh, uh, Bedrick. He said he writes, in truth, the hostility towards yeshivas is not as much grounded in empirical facts as it is in a philosophical worldview. To the elite readers of the New York Times, the primary purpose of education is to convey economically useful skills and politically desired dispositions so that their children can maintain their status in the ruling class. They hold that view without reflection or even awareness that others might think that education should serve different, legitimate purposes. Rather than focusing on the skills that are required to gain status and power, the yeshivas and schools favored by most Americans, favored by most Americans are focused on developing the character of children so that they grow up to be decent human beings. I, I, okay, I would, I would, think, I don't think you can have character or have community if you can't read or write. And like, no. I, I'm sorry, if, if the character of, I'm sorry, like this is where I, where I like my the counter argument to Matt's point is that like if the character of your tradition and community that you're looking to maintain depends on keeping each new generation in a state of complete ignorance about the world, then I don't think it's a, a community or culture worthy of preserving. That's just how I feel about it. Right. Yeah. Um, just my, my two things here. I got to say, Bedrick, that sounds like a guy who makes two appearances in A Song of Ice and Fire, probably gets crushed to death <laughs> by, uh, by the mountains. Uh, second of all, yeah, I saw this pointed to a lot that most Americans support yeshivas. I would love to see um I would love to see uh just that brought that word brought in front of Americans and see them try to define what that word means. Uh shout out to our good friend uh Dan who uh pointed out I think one of the most telling details of the story. Uh basically like the the interesting fact that um girls have a better educational outcome in things like arithmetic and basic literacy because so little emphasis is made on educating them within the yeshiva system that they accidentally are just like learn things because nobody's paying attention to what they're doing. Yeah. They don't have to just read the same book over and over again. They have time for other yeah. shit. But I mean, I guess like, like the broader question outside of like this, uh, an interesting local story about the complete failure of New York state and city government to, um, I don't know, to manage its, uh, you know, educational system and, you know, prevent children from being abused and um, kept in a state of dangerous ignorance. Um, I guess like the broader question is like, it, like the, 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 this religious schooling model of which like education is education in like a fluency in a like modern secular world is it taking the back seat or just completely off boarded for character community tradition you know uh, like you know to sort of mold kids within a non-secular sort of pre-modern tr community and tradition etc is th this thing with this current supreme court like this is going to become more and more de rigueur like would you guys agree with that like th th this model oh, yeah is one that's going to be introduced as and like we've talked about this before but whether it's crt whether it's like you know gender bathroom panic or whether it's you know like prayer in school and things like that, like all, behind all of these, behind all this behind school choice, behind every one of these issues as like the conservative point of view on education or education system is doing away with public school entirely. Yes. I think it's going to be creating a tripartite arrangement. There will still be public schools, but they will be functionally prisons. Like, I mean, yeah. we all, you know, not in the mm -hmm. Foucaultian sense, but like in the literal <laughs> sense that they will just fuck the school, the prison pipeline. It's one room saves time, saves energy. <laughs> then you will have these, yes, like religiously oriented uh, as a substitute, usually for some ethnic orientation, uh, um, um, private school networks for like the uh, lower middle class. Uh, and then uh, private tutors 
the return of the old the old uh, Greek model for the upper crust. Oh, I would have loved that. Um, I uh, like to do fraudage with Aristotle, like young Alexander. Yeah, no, I mean, like, teach me whatever. I don't care. I just, yeah, <laughs> I just want to, I just want to, like, uh, you know, between the thighs, maybe. Yes, yes. That's the way they yeah. did it. That's how they rolled. Yeah, if I had started doing front squats earlier, I think I could have had, like, a gorilla gripper. <laughs> Uh, you, know, you, could have been, I, I, you could have been milking Play-Doh like a goddamn cow. <laughs> yeah, I would have been like the superhead of the uh, computer system. <laughs> I've been well known, like passed around by all the best. Oh, uh, but um, I, so I, I, it's weird, right? I think that there is, I think that since Dobbs, uh, and it's not just about abortion necessarily but i think that there has been a sort of realization of a silent majority of people who wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as socially liberal but are sick of like a social conservative overreach right and that in the best case scenario there is like a broad depolarization in some aspects that's against like you know all the goofy shit all the like 11 year olds have to give birth. Uh, we're going to ruin every fucking parent teacher conference, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't fully bet on the best outcome really ever, you know, but I would say, even if that does happen, you're still going to have the 20%, the 20% of America that's for the foreseeable future, always going to be there and always going to be saying like, no, we do want 11 year olds to give birth. They will go further and further into their, uh, into things like this, as Matt said, I think we'll, I mean, I think we'll, we'll probably see like a parochial version of like QAnon schools, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. Study where the they drops. teach you the proofs. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like, we don't need the Bible. We have the proofs now. The next, the, the, the refinement of the Bible into like action items for life and how to, how to map reality. And I mean, like, I, I think there's a reason why, like, education ha- is increasingly becoming more and more of like a culture war battleground, or I guess like it, it always is because there's a certain truth in like, you know, like uh, the the, the if, who like, is the making reality? Is, is it private yeah, like, or is it some sort of co- public project? Yeah, exactly. There used to be one, but it's gone now. There's no more public uh, consensus reality for people to uh, feel like they can put their children's mind into and 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 feel like they're going to get anything back in return They're, the faith in the systems has collapsed i mean i could see like uh like another another like as we you know at, you know fully enter the second dark age and like you know like the decline of education and literacy being like a, a huge feature of this is like you know as we've seen now with covid with like remote learning like i think it'll just be like like you know like it'll be like a sort of pay pay per session where like you're in a zoom call with like six thousand kids and then, like, there's just like you know a TED. Talk yeah, well, that's the system. thing is that'll be that's how it's you all going to be striated, right? So, like, you're going to have for the kids who fall out of uh, out of control, basically, you're going to get the containment units, and then for people who are just like working class, sending their kids, like the kids who actually are going to go to school, they're going to go to these like big public schools. The first row of it will be uh, the non-existent, non-real teach from uh, home concept, right? Like the thing that we know doesn't work and that does not actually educate kids. That is what uh, is going to be the standard. And then, of course, those kids are going to have to go out into the world and they're going to fucking fall on their asses. But it won't matter because they technically will have been offered an education. But then, like, in places where there's still real estate value in urban areas, they're going to be able to sustain, like, networks of high-quality private education. Uh, yeah. But, but if you have any real money, you're just going to hire somebody to live in your house and teach your kid. And then well, that like, is going and, to stand and, and, in... Like that is going to be like who you get to do that is going to replace like what school they would have gotten into in getting them into, well, you know, the even more uh, refined little academies that uh, are going to exist to like, you know, certify them as part of the new elite. But don't you think at the highest tier, though, like it'll be like the traditional private school experience? Like, do you think like the children of the ultra elite or their parents will want their kid a in the house 24 seven? And B, not getting a social education, like not yeah. interacting. No, with at the very top, it goes back to being proms and, like the ideal you know, education that, and shit. That, they, that the mid-century dream was every kid was going to get, right? Like that chance to live that like unalienated life of the mind, that uh, was the promise of like mid-century prosperity. And now it's going to once again be 
uh, only the province of the ultra elite with no uh, hope of anybody else getting in there. Uh, here's a broader question. And, you know, I ask this, you know, uh, full disclosure with uh, full, full hypocrisy, uh, you know, defenses on as a lifelong child of private education. Should there be private schools in America? Should private no, education be not. a thing? But again, like we don't. Would you want this state to take over education right now? What, it's New like York state? The capacity doesn't exist, you know? But like you'd hope to build it in the process of like defending pr- uh, public education. Like a public education has to actually absolutely be defended with the end goal being have a state capable of extinguishing private education as a concept. Well, it should absolutely I have a be a great idea. I have a great idea for where the New York State education system can free up around uh, a little, uh, quite significantly over a quarter of billion dollars a year. <laughs> I, I know one place they can start freeing up those funds entirely. All right. Uh, well, let's move on to. Uh, I have a reading series for today to round out today's episode. And of course, we're talking, we're talking the queen, you know, we were blindsided on Thursday. We didn't really get a full chance to dive into the queen, but you know, like the reading series is a good one, but the queen is you know, like, it's, it's, it's run its course. You know, like I, I've seen, I've seen enough threads about the history of imperialism. Like it was fun the first day, but you know, look, and here's another thing. I don't really hate the British. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's a little bit of light ribbing among cousins here. Like I, I, I'm yeah. quite fond of British people and British culture. Like they're really no, they're, you know, as we said before, like slightly more fucked up and evil than America is, but like we're their kids. So they're I mean, the earlier generation. They're just like 1.0. Like we're, we're, we're just the upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 um, there, there is nothing more embarrassing to me than when Americans just thoughtlessly repeat like in, uh, anti-Anglo behavior, there are so many people who are completely within their rights. But when an American is like, oh, I hate the fucking I hate the fucking British. Why do you hate them? They eat disgusting slop food and they had the most evil empire in the world. <laughs> huh? Huh? What's the problem? It's just it's protection. It's what when you, they all you decide know, we, that I think- they're IRA members, it's just like, oh, fuck oh, you, God. man. Oh my God! I love the people who like after Armored the queen died and tanks and guns. Oh, sorry. I, I love the people who after the queen died of old age was posting IRA guys. They yeah. didn't do this. It <laughs> <laughs> was it Felix? What the fuck? You describe, you describe Queen Elizabeth as the Walmart greeter of imperialism. And look, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think I, I, that's not to say like none of the defenses of all these people who are like um I'll have you know uh, Queen Elizabeth actually provided presided over the great dismantling of the British Empire. It's just like oh yeah. Like uh, that was her decision, and like you know, the, like none, none of these former colonies were just given independence, like out of the fucking gratitude of the British fucking state. And also, it, just, uh, it, it doesn't count if you just uh, remove the colonial context. You have to actually uh, uh, make up for it. You have to repair the breach. You have to uh, give back the money. Yeah, yeah, and, and, you, that, you, and that's you the can't thing. Just is, hold like, on you know, to money. You know, like look. Yes, it is always. It, it, it's. I understand. It's fun to wind up British people because when you see some, you know, are you having a piss, piss, mate? What are, are you having the bloody getting, laugh at the Queen's getting expense, their knickers, mate. Getting their knickers in a twist because someone's making fun of the damn Queen. It's like, look, how could you how could you resist doing that? Especially when to imagine people actually crying over this shit. Come on, that's what Twitter is for. If you want to be nice, go elsewhere. That being said, though, like the defenses of the Queen from people who were like, oh, I wasn't aware Queen Elizabeth personally did all of the, uh, you know, f- war crimes of the British Empire. It's just like, well, no, but she is, as you are fond of repeatedly bringing up, a symbol of everything Britain and the once great British Empire represents. And most importantly, is still sitting on the billions in wealth and property uh, wrung from the blood of the fucking world. So, like, until she's ready to give that back, then I'm sorry, then, yeah, she still gets to foot the bill for all the evil shit that, great britain did even if she was a lot wasn't alive or technically didn't do it herself she is still the inheritor of like the wealth of an, an entire fucking system that it ever that you can't you can't say that she's uh the symbolic power of a constitutional monarchy is like anchoring you know britain and the uh, people to like its past and tradition and then like get to declaim that same symbolic power when you have to foot the bill for all the evil shit that it represents like the slave trade or the british like Empire. i said you got to give it back or it doesn't count Right, and that's right, why. Like, that's why, as you said, like it rings. I mean, look, everyone likes to be have fun doing it, but it rings a little hollow when she dies at ninety six, never having 
surrendered even an ounce of her fucking authority or had any of her wealth and privilege stripped from her at all. People got so upset for me for saying that. People got <laughs> like, I mean, making jokes well, I mean, is one thing. Like, it, it's fun. Like, there are some funny jokes, but just like acting like it's a victory is just insane. That's ludicrous. I'm sorry. It just is. It is. Don't let me stop I mean, you from having your fun, but like, come on, I mean, like this the, is the victory is in making uh, terrible people uh, get angry and feel bad. But that's oh yeah, for and, sure, like, for about, sure. Like a, but it has like a twenty four hour, uh, you know, like like the the, w- the wick on that stick of dynamite only lasts that long, you know, and then, and then it just fizzles out. I just, I, but it's like I don't know. Again, it's like yeah, okay, they have the. It's ridiculous that they have the queen and now the king and that they love it so much it's hilarious it's um i mean it's always there's always something silly about it when it just like you know like england or fucking japan or any of these places where the monarch doesn't really do anything they're like uh just a purely ceremonial role more or less but i don't know like they have the queen we have like jocko wilnick you know what i mean <laughs> Yeah, we have a democratized monarchy of our all of our favorite stars, all of our all of our butch heroes. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think we talked about this on before, but like, I mean, there's something to be said that like we should have a a monarchy of a king or queen that is like change, but it's not eternal. It changes like every four to eight years, where we just essentially people. elect the number one and two biggest male and female celebrity to be king and queen of America, and we have a vote, and it's a big deal, and we put a lot of passion into it. Meanwhile, our actual elective positions are chosen by sortion in which people are chosen at random to fill sp- seats over a given amount of time. Yeah. And that governing is actually carried out by permanent bureaucracies, which are overseen by a rotating cast of essentially jury duty citizens. But then there are still elections for our lovely, beloved, awesome, beautiful king and queen that we and, uh, put a lot th- of care and passion into. But this is are, very important. Uh, uh, figureheads this is very important for the american king and queen is after they are elected in order for them to be consecrated as the new king and queen of america they need to have sex with full penetration on television and everyone absolutely to watch it. absolutely uh, on the on the on the day of uh, of marriage yeah uh, we all were we just it's you know filmed by steven spielberg yeah it's like the wedding night like the bonds yep. of america a new generation are consecrated by this act of um like you know you can throw in some oral there, but it's got to be P and V. It's got to be P and V. This is basically the plot of the Terry Southern book, Blue Movie. If anyone's ever read that, <laughs> yeah. where I think, a guy, God, where a guy, think, where like a a Spielberg style uh, star uh, director makes a huge budget porno with uh, the biggest stars of Hollywood. God, that would be I was the, literally going to make that. That would be what would we be voting for? Is what movie we get to watch? Yes. Who do we get to see? Fuck. That's do we want to see Suck and Funk? Yes. Better I have the a uh, system, I'll tell you that. I have a question about the uh, randomly selected citizens as permanent bureaucracy. Yeah. Do I is it like uh do I get a per diem if I'm speaker of the house? Yeah. For like a month? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, there's there's uh, a per diem. If you're paid for it just like you are on jury duty more than you get for jury duty though. Like it would be a decent job because yeah, it would no, be like a, this is like a, a career of yeah, like a real commitment to it. It would be a a middle class job uh but it would also be your job for that period. National service. Okay. I will say though, I mean, just back to the um, the defenders of the monarchy and the uh, the weepy editorials that we're going to be subjected to for the next week and a half or so, like two couple weeks. The shit that I just cannot fathom reading was, and I I, I saw this in a couple different articles, but it was variations on this line: "She never complained, never she never complained. called out sick. She, she showed up every day for work and just you know just she just uh, in her she, job she wasn't showy. She was humble." She was just like, I'm like, I'm listen, sorry. Right. She, she, she me, never right? called out sick to what? Listen, she showed listen, up every okay. day. She listen lived here, in a mate. fucking listen palace. Here, mate. No, you listen here, mate. In her, job, <laughs> in her job of existing, every day she got up and existed. Okay? Not anymore. Well, it, well, that, that, but she did it before then. <laughs> every day when years. she was alive, she was alive. <laughs> Doing a duty is queen of England. For all of us, that, mate. That is the most British thing that is what they love more than anything. The stiff up when a you're, bloody lip. Mate. When well, no, not that, but like yeah. specifically when your life is really like not fun and shitty, but you show no sign, you show no outward signs that you are not enjoying it, 
And more importantly, you're still wealthy beyond comprehension and ideally making other people's lives bad. Yeah, that's yeah, their that's, favorite that's thing. That's, that's, their, that's, that's their entire value system is that you, you uh, ritualize away the appearance of enjoying the shit that you actually enjoy. I, but like, I'm sorry, but like, I understand there's a lot of royal duties and I'm probably sure there's a lot of bullshit that you have to put up with, like which gloves you have to wear on what day and, you know, like what, what, what outfit you have to, what attire you're sort of shuffled in and out of. But come on, like she was having fun. The she was like having watching. a laugh. He was having a laugh. You get to watch ponies have fuck each other all day. You get to fucking uh, you play you with your breed dogs. the corgis or, too. Yeah, you get a lot of it. A lot yeah, of just, supervising animals like, yeah, fucking. You just, you, yeah, you yeah you watch you watch animals fuck and then you arrange for your kids to be sold off as breeding stock. See, and this is what we need to cousins. do. We need to democratize that. Instead of her getting to watch all these animals fuck, we get to watch the king and queen fuck. <laughs> oh my god! And we get Felix, the vote on. See, um, that's the replacement for the monarchy. Uh, Felix, I, I, you you uh, you alluded to it on our last episode when the Queen died, but did you see Stephen Miller's new tweet about the monarchy? Oh my God, he <laughs> is okay, just like, <laughs> holy fuck! What is happening to him? What is <laughs> happening to like four years ago? Four years ago, he was like, uh, he was writing Der Sturmer shit, and now it's like, oh my, he's like a fucking little princess in a castle. What the fuck happened? Listen to this. Did they give him some like experimental <laughs> drug to quit smoking, and it just made him insane? It made him into <laughs> it made him into like some fucking little Britner, some like big old some big old gal from Surrey who loves talking well, about the majesty <laughs> of the palace. What the fuck? You know, Felix, you know some people think like the COVID vaccines makes people turn trans. I think like, yeah, yeah. Whatever, like, like this is this that equivalent for Stephen Miller. Listen to this though. He says key to monarchy is its mystery. Key to its mystery is that monarchs descend from an ancient line of fabled kings and queens. <sighs> though it may not be apparent now, a long term concern for UK monarchy monarchy will be if due to marriages, future monarchs have same family trees as their subjects. Okay, like oh, no, the, the, the fucking House of Hanover. They like they they fucking had the most grain three hundred years ago. What the fuck? What mystical line did they come the from? They Arthur, just these are these are fucking square headed krauts. Oh, you <laughs> they fucking a bunch idiot! Of fucking kraut bohunks. There has not been like an Anglo on the throne, honestly, since fucking William the Co Conqueror. There, he's he's complaining. Got, you got dumbed by the frog so long ago. He is complaining that like that this house of fucking Krauts, that they're diluting their bloodline with a USA Network star. <laughs> that's above. <laughs> that's above uh, the house of the house Hanover. of Sax I'm sorry. Gotha, Gotha. Yeah. Felix. Feel, feel like, Holy me, me, fuck. I'm sorry, like, maybe you can back me up on this, but, like, uh, this tweet about the fabled noble lineages of monarchies and then his other one about how, like, the power comes from its mystery. Isn't there something fundamentally wrong about a Jewish guy writing, tweeting about, say, saying shit yes. like this about any monarchy? Or just, like, it's just, it's just, there's something off about it. It just doesn't make, it doesn't add does up. He for, does he not realize that, like, the number one, like, if you're playing, if you're one of the, uh, the Crusader Kings, you know, if you're doing IRL Crusader Kings in the Middle Ages and your your subjects are getting restive, you know, the crops are failing and there's you, they still owe taxes. The, your number one move there is to just yeah, blame the, the Jews. Only, to, to, to send them into the fucking ghettos to crack the their skulls The only open. guy, the fucking one guy who stood against that in the Age of Kings was Napoleon, the bane of the royals. What a fucking... And Cromwell, too. Cromwell, yeah. Two, one, two, it's two always the guys. guys who break with the royal lineages who are able to be like, are you insane? Because like, yeah. Cromwell's the guy who brought, who invited the Jews back to England after they'd been fucking uh, cast, uh, kicked out by Edward Longshank. Yeah, like he's. I guess his fantasy is to be like a court Jew. You know, like what would the? Yes. Oh my god. Yeah, like a, like Queen Elizabeth's doctor, who by the way was blamed for her death. <laughs> Yeah, no. They he, even in his dream, he gets like skinned alive. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm just saying, like outside of like, I mean, like the the history of like you know European nobility and and, and the Jewish peoples of Europe. Um, I just mean like, just like as, as what is like you know uh, the the you know as we were talking about earlier the the best of Jewish traditions, Jewish culture. Like, aren't Jewish people just Shouldn't, shouldn't they have a little bit more pride in being able to see through this horse shit and like not fucking tear up when you think about noble bloodlines and shit like that? Yeah. Okay. Look, there's a lot of in a lot of ways, 
a lot of Jewish people, like there are some aspects of Gentileness that, you know, are desirable, right? Like in the, in the most, um, having your foreskin, sense, having your foreskin, that would have uh, been nice. being able to digest, uh, milk. I got um, that one at least. Thank God. They yeah. couldn't take that one from me. Yeah. Um, uh, just being able to process most foods and drink really. <laughs> um, and then in the like, more, in the really more, com- in the more complex way, you see this in the film by, uh, um, canceled filmmaker Woody Allen Hannah and her sisters just like the ability to not be neurotic the scene where he becomes Catholic I'm sorry still a hilarious scene even though he's an awful guy um but this is something beyond that he doesn't want to be like not Jewish because he's you know he wants to be able to have a have a conversation next to a guy at the urinal at the uh OSU Michigan game (laughs) he uh he, he wants it to I don't, I don't know, uh, carry a fucking message from the princess to the Duke and live some wretched palace romance. It's really, it's really like deeply upsetting. He believes in it more than I think any Royal. Oh yeah. No, those are the people who prop up royalty. Always the royalty can never actually act for its own interest because it's too self-satisfied. The the engine is those, those lower orders grinding upward by the usually propelled by their own insanity. Uh, and in his case, they're like, like psychosexual domination by this force that he wants to control him. You know what I got to say, uh, you know, her talking about how like the, their ideal thing is, uh, someone who's, uh, miserable, but shows no sign. Mm-hmm. They should just they should skip everything, make Kate Middleton the queen now. Because she yeah, is just she is the best at that. She is having the worst time of her she life. She doesn't seem to be <laughs> enjoying it much. She, it's like right. you can she kind is, of tell that like whatever Meghan Markle went through that made her go fuck this, like Kate Middleton got her version of it, you know, not along the same axis, but the similar like horror. Uh and yeah, but she, she just buckled that shit down because she's yeah, more of an inbred freak. Like it's yes. it's a mark of how much of a mutant she is that she didn't rebel. Meghan Markle she was is, being normal. <laughs> yeah, Meghan Markle had the correct. I think that whole. I'm sick of hearing about her. I don't want to hear oh, yeah, her fucking cares? podcast about mental health. I don't care. But <laughs> uh, she had the right reaction. But Kate Middleton is like doomsday. She's like the alien that killed Superman. Yeah, she's like the the more misery you throw at her, like the more that her hideous husband cheats on her, and oh, the more God, like all of. Like the fact that she married him, like she married him and it was like a, he, she married the Dorian gray painting and then <laughs> yeah. she just got him. She got the painting instead of the guy. Dude, just, it's fucked up. The, 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 the proudest sides. Yeah. Like, the, like William Matt used to be handsome. Fucking Nosferatu. Dude. I, like I, if he was I, a I, bank I examiner. I feel bad for William because like he did used to be handsome. He had yeah, the yeah, a minute, like, you know, a hot minute like, for a minute, for a minute. But like the second he turned 30, he went off like a pear. Being uh, like like he it was just all his hair. His arc. hair went. My God, like, dude, fucking baldness went. His hairline went down like faster than the Mangino line. It just fucking just obliterated. And then, and then his teeth started to like get more. It seemed like his gums receded or something. Like his teeth got bigger in his he head. He is hideous now. Yeah, he is. He, he, got is, the, he is hideous. He, creature. They should put an iron mask on him and put him in the keep of the Tower of London. He got the opposite of braces, and then his face. It was like a a, a fucking chocolate <laughs> Easter rabbit left on a radiator. Um, but she she's she is like she, she she's like um. The more misery you put you put her through, like her disgusting husband uh, cheating on her, uh, the awful duties, like her favorite thing to do is there will be 50 tabloid stories about him, like fucking uh, like his maid's niece or something. And then it's like the very next day they have to go to a preschool class and like answer questions about what it's like to be like in love, like the most <laughs> horrifying, humiliating thing you can think of and just fucking gritting her teeth smiling through it uh the 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 thing where it's like she gets pre- she got pregnant like instantly it was almost like a fucking irish wedding she had like 12 kids w- within yeah, a week of the wedding shooting them out and, and and there were all those stories about how miserably bad her pregnancies were like like there were all these uh leaked stories about how like she was basically uh had no morning sickness for the entire nine months Good yeah God. just the worst thing probably no epidural probably nothing they probably like tried to give her poppy tea just to keep in line with tradition but like she is even 
the, the thing that the British tabloids pra- praised her for, and it's like, th- this is all you need to know about the country. They praised her for not gaining any weight after the break. <laughs> <Jesus. laughs> like, just Christ. She is so That's str- you from so, keeping it tight, ma'am. <laughs> that's literally it. It's like they're, she is living the worst life you can live for somebody with hundreds of millions of dollars. Yep, and that makes her this princess. Christ-like figure, and that is why she is appealing, because she right. embodies that value. But, like, honestly, this could all be a promo thing. Like, maybe she's having a great time. Maybe this is all kayfabe. Maybe th- they leak those stories about how bad her pregnancy is. Who knows? Oh. There's no way to see beyond the mask. But her performance of self that we get is of misery, of 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 endured misery for the greater good, which we should. Oh, emulate God, maybe, in maybe, maybe I'm as dumb as Stephen Miller. <laughs> Listen to me. Yeah, there you go. Well, OK, if we're talking about performances of misery, the self-performance of misery and suffering, you guys are, of course, going to love you. You will, you will never guess where this royal remembrance comes from. That's right. It's courtesy of Chicago's own John Cass. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. John Cass has a column called My Mom and the Queen that uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy. We're going to go long today, but it's worth it. for th- This is another Cass banger. This is, you know, I, di- I didn't want to read any of like the Tory Graph or fucking Andrew Sullivan or any actual, actual British person talking about the Queen. We need to hear from the angriest Greek, Greek man in Chicago about what he his feelings on the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. You boys ready for this? Yeah. Hey. John Cass, Dateline, September 11th, 2022. When Queen Elizabeth II died the other day, there were two things I had to do. The first was to call my 92-year-old mom and see how she was taking Oh, it. no. His mom's like, alive. <laughs> like many women of her World War II generation, my mom revered the 96-year-old queen. She revered Queen Elizabeth for her dignity her service to her people, for keeping that stiff upper lip, whether she felt like it or not, for putting duty and country first, and the Queen's stoic reserve at a time when Western culture has become increasingly consumed with cheap theatrical displays of emotion and public sentimentality. I'm not a fan of kings or royals. If you grew up in Chicago... (laughs) I'm not a fan of uh, kings or royals, okay? My his mom is uh, John is just now saying I'm not a fan of kings or royals. If you grew up in Chicago, you grew up in a city where many were eager to bend the knee and kiss the hand. Rather than support the divine rights of kings in a monarchy, I'd much rather we support a meritocracy of equal opportunity where the best and the hardest working rose to the top. Like is the that NFL- what happened with you? Is, <laughs> no, that, is that the story of your life, John? You're never going to guess where he goes to this. God. I'd much rather we support a meritocracy of equal opportunity where the best and the hardest working rose to the top, just like the NFL or the English Premier League. <laughs> God. <laughs> so he says, God. It's like, you know what? I mean, I kind of agree with him, you know, like uh, Tom Brady's Tom Brady because he's won the most Super Bowl. You know, you, you know, look. Peyton and Eli Manning, sure, they're from football royalty, but they proved it on the gridiron. Okay, yeah. Um, I like the aside he has about how people in Chicago uh, bend the knee and kiss the hand. <laughs> I don't know hand. what he's, like, alluding to. I, 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 I Do you think there was something in there about, do you think that it was, like, that feels incomplete, you know? Like, it feels like they're supposed to be kissing someone's hand, and he was going to say, like, race hustlers. Yeah. <laughs> Some fucking well, insane term like that. Well, here, well, here's where he goes with it. Uh, he goes, the, the the competition and striving made America great, but we don't have that anymore in America. Instead, we have politics that offer equity, a racist practice where winners and losers are selected not on merit, but by immutable, immutable characteristics like skin pigments. But my mom just loved Queen Elizabeth. I know he didn't even get to the second thing he has to do yet. So I'm just, keep that in mind. Also, like for he loves talking about Chicago, this Chicago, that. Um, but like the idea, especially for an ethnic white person, to say that there was just pure, colorless uh, meritocracy, like in Chicago, like the, yeah, it was the, all there, like whichever Polish uncle you had that <laughs> determined what job you got uh, with the city. Yeah, it, no, it, it, it was like Chicago. A, it, was like, it was it was a familial. Chicago, in the time of Cass's life and his fucking horrifyingly alive mother, uh, was essentially it was like having a monarchy system, but for who gets to be the garbage man? <laughs> if you were the right, if you were white, if you were white, yes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and like yeah. Harold Washington, the whole Harold Washington movement was basically trying to break up that ethnic control and like actually de affirmative actionize the system. Yeah, he should have gone as far as Cromwell. Indeed. So he goes, uh, <laughs> but, but my mom just loved Queen Elizabeth. I know, I know, mom said over the phone, her voice soft. I'm watching on the TV. The queen is dead. Long live the king. She paused for a moment, sighed deeply, and said, Zwa se ma, life to us. Long live King Charles. As a young woman, my mom left her native Canada and the civilized small town of Guelph, Ontario, to marry my father and make her new life in Chicago, in the tough back-of-the-yards neighborhood. It was a neighborhood of many strong churches and busy taverns and drunks and fights, all of it smelling like a slaughterhouse, because the old Union Stockyards was America's slaughterhouse. Sounds like a wonderful place to make your day. I mean, imagine, imagine, uh, I mean, I don't know, I guess Ontario is pretty boring, but imagine leaving that for uh, the neighborhood that smelled like a slaughterhouse. Yeah. See, lo- it's, it's all, he loves Chicago. It's all the Chicago colors. It's, you know, we don't have that in America anymore. We don't have neighborhoods that are full of taverns and churches and smell like a cow that just shat and bled itself to death in front of you. He doesn't, he, I don't feel like he gets out much. It's like, there's still, you know, no, doesn't fucking- he just hang around? Like, he goes to the hardware store or something. I think that's it. Now, yeah, he, he does, like, a, a conversational version of cruising, I guess. Um, <laughs> but he... He, he goes he to the Home be... Depot and looks for a guy with which color apron re- corresponds to what kind of conversation <laughs> you want to have. Sports, the weather, or power tools. Yeah, I guess rough trade is, like, ethnic <laughs> jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, keep in mind, keep in mind, though, that this column ostensibly started about like his mom liking the queen of England now, like, and now just brace yourself for this tree of lifestyle fucking memory that John Cass has sharing from his mom. He goes as a newlywed, she once looked out their apartment window to the corner tavern where she saw a man get completely knocked out of his shoes with one punch. They must've been slip ons, you know, loafers. She said once it had been raining and the shoes just stayed there as he flew backwards. I said to myself, welcome to Chicago, and life is just a bowl of cherries. Did I tell your father about the man who was punched out of his shoes? Of course not. <laughs> what, what, what? What's the, the point of that story? Fuck. Oh, my she God. She saw the first so knockout weird. game. <laughs> <laughs> As she settled into the unfamiliar world of her new life in Chicago, Elizabeth became queen and my mom's touchstone. She didn't talk about the queen with her friends. She didn't act like some royal groupie. But I was her son. I knew. And there was that National Geographic of the coronation on the coffee table she kept for years. Some Americans take inspiration from sports stars and showbiz types. But there was once but there once was an America where performers weren't considered leaders or role models any more than actors or tap dancers. Again, like, what century is What's his brain in? Fu- this is I remember Bob I remember Dillian. America where people didn't look to tap dancers for moral instruction. <laughs> yeah. It used to be about how hard you work, not how well you danced to Charleston. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it's so These kids today out of his fucking mind. With their minstrel yeah. shows. And their and their <laughs> he, and I have a feeling you wouldn't complain about that. <laughs> uh, no, he, he 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 um they're penny dreadful magazines. <laughs> He's like he must have been getting into the sausage again because this is like yeah. old cast. I love the thing about like wait, like why wouldn't she tell the dad about the <laughs> shoe, the shoes? Like it just, and why wouldn't yes, she tell her friends? Didn't want him to worry about Elizabeth. her that the neighborhood might be rough. I don't know. And I also, oh I, I also, God. I also like he said out came out there. I also like that he said she wasn't some royal groupie. She just kept uh, the commemorative National Geographic magazine in our living room for 40 years. Does he know yeah, what the word groupie that's... means? Yeah. <laughs> she was getting slutted yeah, out yeah, by exactly. Lord Monbotton. You, you have to have sex with him, I think, to be groupies, right? <laughs> Actually, John may have been getting slutted out by Lord Monbotton, if we know his proclivities. Zing! Mm. <laughs> it, yeah, it's like he's, he's like, my mom is a great old gal who left Ontario, and not once did she ever get a passport, fly to England, and, you know, <laughs> To fuck a 15 year old uh, Prince Charles. I, I just, I don't know what any of this means for uh, any well, of keeps us. Going. It keeps going. I, we have not even got, we have not even gotten to the most insane part of this uh, article yet. Oh boy. As a girl, my mother had listened to the bombing of London on the radio. As her father, my grandfather, fought in Europe for Canada in his second world war, in, in his second world war, having also fought in World War I. 
And the House of Windsor and Winston Churchill led Great Britain through the darkness, not by cheap and sensational emotional speeches, not by cheap theatrics, but by example. Elizabeth's stoicism meant everything to my mother. She and millions across the world took inspiration from the English monarch. And because my mom felt this way, there was the second thing I had to do. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a chance. Oh, no. Like, I'm going to give you guys a chance to see if you can guess what the second thing John Cass had to do after talking to his 92-year-old mother on the phone is when he heard the news that Queen Elizabeth had died. Okay, Matt, Let's guess. you go first. Go to the hardware store. Okay. Felix? Okay. I'm going to say um, go to her house and like sand off a bunion. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You ready for this? Okay. And because my mom felt this way, there was that second thing I had to do. Rewatch and reconsider a superb 2006 film, The Queen, starring Helen Mirren as Queen Elizabeth II. He had to do that? He had to. <laughs> what he had to the do it, Mad Dog. Fuck? He had to do it. <laughs> Never in a million fucking years imagine that like okay like <laughs> he's like yeah my mom is a huge fan of Queen Elizabeth II I had to talk to her me personally I'm a huge fan of two thousand Stephen Frears' 2006 film The Queen starring Helen Mirren <laughs> my god that is amazing oh my the queen, god the queen, is, the queen is the exact type of movie where it is only remembered because it got some big star their Oscar finally yep that has no cultural resonance no, whatsoever. No he resonance whatsoever. the first person whatsoever. to have thought of that movie in a decade. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to this. You're Especially the now. King's speech next? <laughs> <laughs> Especially now, with the queen to be lying in state and celebrity news commentators and their political agendas working overtime. <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> He's, oh like, my he's getting God. preemptively mad at celebrity news commentators and they're political injecting their political agenda into the royal the funeral. God, they're getting their politics into my royal piece. <laughs> what? Like a tragedy. Who, he can't watch anything but Newsmax. And he's just like, he's like imagining Wolf. Blitz. Like he even like. His most hated news channel, like MSNBC, <laughs> wouldn't be like, oh, this colonial bitch is dead. Like, what Listen the fuck this. is he talking Listen about? He's not even dead. He's not even done yet. He says, uh, with the queen lying in state and celebrity news commentators and their political agendas working overtime, along with revisionist worm tongues who would make history unrecognizable. So if you haven't seen it, allow me to recommend it. It's worth your time. You might think me foolish to focus on a movie. I, I never, John. I love movies, especially when there is so much news and live commentary about the royals now. But will the media peel its own skin? What? But will the media peel its own skin? Gross. The film deals with the modern political celebrity media culture that demanded Queen Elizabeth humble herself. Wear her emotions on her sleeve for all to see to the delight of the emotionally unhinged mob that really didn't know Diana, but hysterically wept for her. Dude, you, your mom doesn't know the fucking queen and she's crying over this old bat. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you I, talking about? Oh, my God. I love that he is an American who hates Diana. <laughs> yes, you can tell he like she fucking was a hates trollop. <laughs> she embarrassed the family. She, she, she could have gotten AIDS into the palace. <laughs> she gave AIDS to the queen by touching all those people. <laughs> she's <laughs> cavorting with a Saracen. <laughs> he is. He's the what we found him. The one American who just fu- not even Anglo, not a drop of Anglo blood. And he's like that bitch, Diana. Spencer. Okay. Dude, okay. You guys, you guys are not, the article's not over yet. Like he, there, oh, like boy. it gets so much more insane. Listen to oh this. Oh my God. Helen Mirren won an Oscar for her performance. She's brilliant in this, a study in control, just like her subject. And it mirrors exactly what my mother and many others loved about Queen Elizabeth II. The film focuses on the difficult period following the death of former princess Diana Spencer 25 years ago. The queen refused to participate in the national drama about Diana. She wanted no part of it. The media didn't like her silence and her approval ratings dropped. Elton John so wanted to perform at the funeral and all but demanded it. He recast his song about Marilyn Monroe, the Hollywood sex goddess who committed suicide after being passed around like some broken toy by the Kennedy brothers. His song a broken about toy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why would you pass would... around a broken toy? You probably he's put it in the garbage. A, he's such a like just in fundamental ways is such a terrible writer. 
like really his true. his his command of like analogies and similes is just it is it, it, it's like if you were showing a remedial student what not to do but like it, it's it's just like he has the brain of an old woman though it's like it's like his mother's brain has been like some sort of like freaky friday has put essentially his mother's sensibility about oh you know, Diana thought she was too big for the Trump. She was a pop star into the body of a man who's been eating sausage and watching the bears for the last 60 years. OK, this is probably why he has trouble getting out and making friends. It's like he's there are probably, probably probably like plenty of big old Polacks who would love to talk to him about like, ah, oh, the bears fucking suck, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, remember, oh, I wish we could give, bring Ozzy Gian back. And he's just over there and he's like. Can you believe that people are talking about Diana today? <laughs> no, he <laughs> like what? Yeah, no, he, like like he'd be he'd be at the, the local tavern. He'd be at the local tavern trying to talk about the Bears, and he'd be like, "Oh, what do you what do you think of their defensive line this year?" And then John Cass would be like, "I used to love the Bears until they made they made the game all about celebrity when they did that awful Super Bowl <laughs> shuffle song." <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the like, mock yeah. sensibilities of the of the the the, un, the the unhinged mob hooting and hollering for the refrigerator Perry doing the shuffle. No, thank you. This is about meritocracy and honor. He probably there's probably a lost John. Take Cass those sunglasses off, Jim McMahon. Take them off. You're inside. <laughs> it's probably like a lost John Cass column from the day that Walter Payton died, where it's like. <laughs> Well, looks like you finally got your comeuppance for your violent rap all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, John, we can't run this. <laughs> okay, listen to this. Listen to this. Okay, his song about Norma Jean was refit to cast Diana as the English Rose. Was it dignified to refit a song for Monroe as the funeral anthem for Diana? Would you want it done for your sister or mother or wife at their funeral? I mean, yeah, I would. I mean, like, if Elton Sounds John nice. wants to do a personal tribute to my daughter, sister, wife, or mother, then yeah, honored, I, yeah, I'd be sir. fine with that. I would but barely know you and that. Elton John. These are some of the great talents of our time. <laughs> no, you don't get it. You don't get it. Uh, Marilyn Monroe had sex. She wasn't a virgin she when was she gross. got married. So well, she's yeah, here, here, here she's it goes. Gross. Yeah. If you ask that, I suppose then I have no further questions for you. But I wouldn't want a song at a family funeral associated with a broken sex goddess plaything of American political royalty. But maybe that's just me. He's so <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> he is such a he's the most he should choke. He should up. choke. Oh my, he's like. St- he was like barely alive when she was, and he's like furious about her having sex. <laughs> yes. He's like, 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 just disgusted with her, and he's trying, okay. like, he, he, he's so like, he's trying to conceal it with like, oh, she was like used by men, but like, really, at the heart of that is like that disgusting bitch. She was already used up by the time she got to Arthur Miller. It's the, <laughs> it's the Madonna horror thing. Like, we have Queen Elizabeth, and then, or uh, I guess Diana, uh, and then you have. Marilyn Monroe, just like now we have Kate Middleton and uh, Meghan Markle. We've got a Madonna and whore all over again, and we should be yeah. able to vote on which one we see naked. Yeah, but listen he to this. Like, listen, he, he goes further with it. You talk about like the Madonna whore thing. Listen to this. He goes, it could just be me and my cultural deficiencies and weaknesses, but then we don't sing songs at our funerals, except perhaps Lamentations. At Diana's funeral extravaganza, Marilyn Monroe melded with the English Rose as if they were spiritual sisters. And the thing about that is, like, actually the comparison between Marilyn Monroe and Princess Diana is kind of apt. Because, like, I mean, it, both in, like, the, the celebrity that they were, uh, you know, elevated to, the things that people read into them, the uh, sexuality, but also the way in which they were kind of, like, used and driven to their deaths by the people around them. Either, you know, murder in one case, suicide, overdose in the other. Both both uh, leave a lot of questions, I would say. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, alleged murder. I mean, like, your, your mileage may vary. But it says here, okay. Yeah. Um, the prime minister at the her time mile, was Tony Blair. Her mileage did vary. <laughs> oh, yes. R.I.P. Uh, the prime minister at the time was Tony Blair, a slickster mm-hmm. who had much in common with the former president, Bill Clinton. It was Clinton who could emote on a dime. Americans wanted that sort of thing then. And then the world came to want it too. Everything became about your feelings. I love that. I, I love that he's like a fuck your feelings guy because he is the most maudlin cocksucker on the planet. There is nobody whose feelings are elevated to like a more fucking a hysterical high pitch than this fucking sausage snarfing fucking plot. 
He just he just had a tantrum over a song dedicated to Marilyn Monroe being used at Diana's funeral. Like he is like just the things he takes offense at are things I would never guess. Like just this very suggestion of sexuality. Like and it, that song that song isn't like oh Marilyn you were fucked by all the big guys you know it's like it's a sad song it just the 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 being being within a hundred square miles of like vaginal penetration just it destroys him when Blair christened Diana post mortem as the People's Princess public sentiment in the UK turned against the Queen who had refused to dance and emote. He's doing the floss dance. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing you know, the doggie. I was um I was too disgusted by his uh yeah his everything that I I missed that he said Bill Clinton could emote on a dime. Another <laughs> just, just emote. brilliant drop emote right on a dime. Boom. What would that mean, John? The phrase is just, turn on just, a dime. He would go to he would do a press conference and then he would just have them like a like at an improv show, he'd just yell out emotions and then he would just do them right then and there. But it's like then you would say if you're like he's already using a cliche, but then you would say like at the drop of a hat, you know. Yeah. But he says that like you turn on it, it's hard to turun on a dime because of the radius, you fucking Hellenic idiot. <laughs> he doesn't write good. It's he is a product of that mid century affirmative action. Just just like, hey. Yeah. Are you uh, are you an ethnic white guy who is like in some way, vague way relative related to World War II? Well, here you go. <laughs> Did he go to a yeshiva? A job writing where your job is going to be <laughs> where your job is going to be to complain every day about how everybody around you is complaining all the time. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through the end here. It says, um, it was that refusal to give into emotion that kept England strong through the bombings and kept their spirit up. Would satisfying our inner snowflakes lead a nation and keep it strong? And when she finally capitulates to save the monarchy, the Tony Blair character congratulates her for demonstrating proper humility. You're confusing humility with humiliation, she says. Boom. There will be hours and hours and hours. Yeah, boom. That's just one line, one word. He wrote boom. boom? Mike dro- he wrote boom. Oh like my Mike Drop. He wrote boom. That's hilarious. There will be hours and hours and hours of news coverage about the Queen's funeral. There will be much gossip and intrigue. The worm tongues will be in all their glory. Before she died, she approved of each step of the funeral rites, from the processions to the songs that will be played, and who stands where. It's all political theater approved by an extremely strong woman who didn't want to shed public tears, but who knew the power of ceremonial and rich, who knew the power of ceremonial and ritual. Wouldn't it, shouldn't it be the power of ceremony and ritual? Forget yeah. fucking The mm-hmm. choreographer is poet at a nation's heartstrings. Last line of this article, do yourself a favor and watch the queen. <laughs> just incredible. <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Like just, I'm so glad he doesn't have an editor oh, anymore. Man. That was a virtuoso oh. performance by an opinion columnist. Oh man, the, he really is the best. You know, he's like the he's, he's, he's it's unbelievable. How do you end that on watch the quit? Like, what's this fucking? Movie? That was like one of those uh, Larry King tweets. Yeah, do yourself it's my a two favor cents and watch the Queen. <laughs> he at no point does he like explain why the movie's good. Yeah, he doesn't even say. He just says like, "Yeah, he's she's in it, and she has to do stuff." He doesn't say anything about what makes it a good film. Do you think that there was like, um, they tried to do like movie night at John Cass's house with like his uh, loose acquaintances from the bar, and they're like, "Oh, let's put on the Expendables. Let's put on," and he just he's just putting on bullshit like this, <laughs> like weeping at the majesty of the queen, and everybody like, just sort of awkwardly slips away one at a time. Yeah, just then he Irish just buys him while he's just wrapped watching the, sh- the show. Yeah, he's drinking like an Uzo cocktail, and he's like, "Did you know she she showed students how to use a diaphragm for cunnilingus?" He's just still complaining <laughs> about Diana. <laughs> oh man, what a, what a, what he's a the best! Go- he's the best. <laughs> he's the fucking. I'm best. so. I'm so glad you like got into him. Well, I, I'm a I like cast head. I gotta be a cast yeah. head. Just, just the anecdote about her, 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 just like out of nowhere, the story about how her, his mom told him, but not his dad, that she saw a guy get punched out of his shoes, <laughs> like a fucking Looney Tunes character. I really wish that he had like made it to the big leagues in his career. Like, I would have loved. 
I would have. If he was like a Trump. CNN contributor and you got to see him on the news, like talking and shit. My my yeah. mom, my mom when she was a kid, she saw a piano fall from a third floor balcony onto a guy's head. And then he popped his head out of the top and his teeth were the piano keys. <laughs> <laughs> and she never told my father. He's too like he's too like artistic to ever be like a CNN talking head. He'll never sell probably, out. He'll never yeah, sell they out. Probably, they probably did like a screen test where he's on Fox News or something. And he just he just starts like crying. Rant. Like they're trying. That's they're talking point. about like, like him generally make at least some sort of a stab at a TV career because it's such yeah. easy money. It's very hard to say no to. I mean, how many how many millions of fucking like uh, sports writers got TV careers out of like around the yeah. horn and shit? Yeah, Bern- Bern- they put Bern- Jay Mariotti on TV. It. <laughs> Bernard because, Goldberg. Yeah, Jerry Mariotti got on TV. Maybe he's just too off putting. Bernard yeah, Goldberg. I think he's an in, he's industry plant. He's an industry plant. John John. <laughs> yes, yeah. he's in the streets. He's for real. Yeah, I do. We went to Bernard Goldberg's hood. No one knew him. He's straight from the <laughs> industry. Uh. Fucking John Cass, probably, they probably did a screen test around like Lev Parnas, yes. that era. And he went on and he's like, my mother is 90 years old and she has never even heard of finger banging. <laughs> 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 they're like, they're like, what the, what the <laughs> fuck? You're, you're supposed to be defending Trump on the Ukraine perfect call. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. I know, damn it. Let me cook. <laughs> he just. He just starts crying about how, like, the flower shop near his house has a black assistant now. <laughs> just like, this is too weird. Like, this, what the fuck is this? You know, <laughs> he goes going off on a tangent about how Florence Nightingale, like, uh, <laughs> got her pussy ate, and that's why she's not worthy <laughs> of being celebrated. Yeah, yeah. He's like, Eleanor he's like, Roosevelt. You know Helen Keller jacked off one time? Fuck this damn yeah. bitch. I could I could picture it. It's just like yeah, it, it is. It's um, it'd be like the the first impeachment, and they're like, can you like they listened in on his phone call, and he's like, you know, in my day, um, there weren't these Beats headphones worn by urban gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen. Lori Lightfoot's perfect, perfect downtrodden, oppressed. We would take a record player and we uh, we wouldn't leave ten paces outside our mother houses and we would dance to Bing Crosby. And you know what, Eleanor Roosevelt, the moment that it was okay, she started wearing jeans. A first lady wearing blue jeans like a cowhand would. And you wonder, you wonder why we went through the troubles we did as a nation. Oh, please, please give this man a TV show, please. Before it's too late, because it might be yeah. too late very soon. Yeah, he's decaying. <laughs> oh, man, we went real long today, but it, it was worth it. It was worth it for that absolutely. cast column. It was absolutely was worth it. Wonderful. What a joy. What a fucking joy. Him. All right. Uh, we did the plugs up top, so I think we should just say uh, bon voyage, and uh, just, our thoughts are with the queen and the whole royal family. That's right. God save the bloody queen in hell. Yes.